the ultimate car guy. A conversation with Bob Lutz on 10 years since the automotive bankruptcies and what he thinks the future holds. And journalist Soledad O'Brien on why Michigan and Detroit will mean so much in the upcoming presidential election. Today is Sunday, August 18th, 2019. This is Flashpoint. Hello and welcome to Flashpoint. I'm Sandra Ali. Devin is off this week. Friends, family and colleagues gathered to say goodbye to longtime Oakland County Executive L. Brooks Patterson this week after decades in office. His passing certainly marks the end of an era in county politics, but the tributes and remembrances for Patterson came against the backdrop of discord and disarray among the many who wanted to replace him, even temporarily. Resignation, rescindment, interviews, infighting, and in the end, a Democrat. Ferndale Mayor Dave Coulter has the county's top job. Political passions are what brought journalist Soledad O'Brien to town this week. Most experts agree the next presidential election will be decided in states like Michigan, and that outcome will be determined in large part by turnout in cities like Detroit. So she came here to talk to Michiganders about what's motivating them and disheartening them in the current political climate. My conversation with Soledad is coming up. But let's begin with a conversation Devin had with Bob Lutz. He's up first this morning on Flashpoint. It's been 10 years since General Motors and Chrysler filed for bankruptcy. It was a time of crisis for the industry and the city of Detroit. Devin Skillian recently sat down with legendary auto executive Bob Lutz, who spent most of his storied career at each of the big three. Lutz reflected on that difficult time a decade ago and where the industry is now. General Motors, from having been really the most powerful corporation in the world for so long. Is it still, does it strike you as surreal that it had to, that it ended up there? Well, you know, that was part of the problem. Uh, it was the feeling of, oh, GM is so big and powerful, nothing can ever happen to it. And that was the same attitude with the UAW. Yeah, they say they can't afford it, but we've heard that one before. And they're so big, nothing's going to happen to GM. Well, you know, when things happen, they happen. And we've seen cities go bankrupt, and, and uh, n nothing is too big to go Chapter 11. And in, at the end of the day, yes, it was a big surprise. Um, and as Mitt Romney says, he didn't like the government bailout. It should have been a private uh, Chapter 11. Well, <laughs> I mean, he didn't realize. Of course we went to the banks, of course we went to private institutions, and when we went to the banks and said, hey, we need a few billion to tide us over, they just turned their pockets inside out and said, we're in worse shape than you are. And so the, at that point, the government was really the last resort. In fact, it, that was part of the, it really was this perfect storm. It came right a, 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 during the financial collapse. It was a, a, a collapse of a financial and economic collapse of a magnitude really not seen since 1929. And of course, at GM, and I'm sure Chrysler did the same thing, uh, we carefully planned financially in our forward projections, we even baked in uh, a recession and said, well, we'll probably have a recession with about a 15 to 20 percent reduction in demand, which is what most recessions usually are. But nobody counted on 55 to 60 yeah. percent and sport utilities basically s ceasing to exist in the marketplace. Uh, the, the combination of the radical switch to small cars on the part of the consumer because of the four dollar and thirty cent gasoline, the rapid switch to small cars in, in consumer desire and coupled with uh, the total almost elimination of demand for sport utilities and full size pickup trucks, which was what was keeping the American car industry afloat. That was a devastating combination. It just, it was, it was not survivable. Ten years later, we're back at really cheap gas, and the automakers are again relying on the profit centers of SUVs and trucks. Well, they're relying on them because every effort to sell passenger cars and small cars meets with a total disaster, and the public says, thank you very much, we don't want those. And, I mean, the American public does have a pretty short memory when it comes to fuel shortages. 
Uh, I don't think we're going to have one in the future because uh, uh, thanks to fracking, um, the, the U.S. is now largely self-supporting. And, and in fact, I think we're a net energy exporter. So we're no longer at the mercy of the Middle East, which is a good thing both for national security and for uh, gasoline supplies. And I, I, I think we can reliably figure that gasoline is going to stay in about th this price range. We would appear to be falling behind the Chinese when it comes to electrification at the moment. I guess the question is, is that a race that we need to be trying to win? Uh, I know you've always had a certain skepticism about where electric, in fact, I've always remembered you saying that uh, years ago, because I drove a Volt for a while, which was, yeah. I loved it. But you pointed out G nobody was impressed with a, a high functioning electric hybrid sedan. It should have started with an SUV, well, then sure, people that would have. That would have been better. Would have been different. But, but where are you on electrification uh, well, right now? Well, I, I still believe it's the long term future of the automobile. I mean, within, and I, I, I sometimes miss on time periods because sometimes I say 15 years when I, when I should say 25 or 30, but one thing is for certain, your grandkids will be transported electrically. And to the extent that they can still drive, they will drive electrically. But it's gonna take longer than the media suggested because um, it's just not cost efficient, not cost effective right now. The the plain fact is, it's the reason that Tesla is losing money. They cost more to build than what you can sell them for, and the problem is the cost of the battery pack and all the other components. Now I know that General Motors and others are working feverishly down the short-term average cost curve to try to take, you know, get more efficiencies in battery construction. Um, have more suppliers bidding for the business and uh, electric motors and control systems will become a commodity as opposed to really specialized things. So the cost will come down, but it's, it's going to have to come down quite a bit before EVs can compete on a cost basis with a conventional four-cylinder engine and automatic transmission. That's, that's, cause ju that's just going to take a while. The reason the Chinese are electrifying <coughs> faster than we are is because their government subsidies for the purchase of an electric vehicle are off the chart. They were in Denmark, too, which made Tesla almost the number one selling vehicle in <laughs> Denmark. <laughs> then the government said, whoops, can't afford that anymore. And the, it's interesting with electric vehicles, the minute the government yanks the subsidies, uh, the, the sales go way down, which means that at this point, people still have to be bribed, um, use the term loosely, yeah. to buy an electric vehicle. <laughs> and the manufacturers are making a financial sacrifice to provide the, the public with these things. So f financially, they still, and everybody always gets so upset when I say this, but it's the truth. Financially, they still make no sense. Someday they will, but today they don't. Let me go back to the bankruptcy, because uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on that horrible moment, I think, for the auto industry, watching the, the automotive CEOs yeah. sitting before Congress. Yes, that was one of the most shameful chapters in automotive history. And there, there was some PR genius who advises CEOs how, how to behave, who told him, don't talk back, don't ask questions, don't push back on anything, just keep nodding your head and bow your head in shame and stare at your, stare at your feet. I thought that was the most ridiculous advice ever given anybody. And uh, uh, at uh, Lee Iacocca's funeral, somebody asked me a, a related question, and I'll tell you what, if Lee Iacocca had been in front of that subcommittee, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have taken that advice. He would have been constantly saying, excuse me, Senator, but with all due respect, your question implies something that simply is not true. Let me set the record straight for you. That would have been Lee Iacocca, and uh, I think GM if, if they wanted the rules obeyed, it was, 
a good thing they never let me anywhere near those hearings. The other thing that became clear through those hearings, though, was a lack of understanding on the part of a lot of important people in Washington about how the auto industry works oh, and the absolutely. way that it threads its way through so much of the American economy. I threw, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, do, during when I worked for Lee Iacocca, he would frequently send me to Washington to meet with some senator or some influential congressman or other to discuss trade issues. Well, trying to explain the Japanese cost advantage, not due to us not doing our jobs, or, but due to exchange rates because the yen was artificially set at a very low level. That gave the Japanese the equivalent of a $4,000 per unit cost advantage. You can't overcome that with smarts and efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I had to go to Washington and I talked to these guys and, and their staffers. And at the end, it was, uh, well, thank you very much for coming in, Mr. Lutz. It's, it's been nice talking to you, but I just got one word of advice for you and your colleagues in Detroit. Stop complaining and start competing. And that was that would be the outcome of those meetings, and you'd walk out of there shaking your head and think, "These guys don't get it." But it was, uh, it, it was the same mentality that said GM is too big to go bankrupt. It, there was a, a general hubris in Washington. We're so big and powerful. What do you mean unfair trade? Let the others sell their stuff in our country. It can't do us any harm. Our corporations are so big and so powerful. And there's a, this a, a totally mistaken image of the health of American industry. They didn't see the Koreans coming, the Japanese coming. They didn't see, apparently didn't register that the Japanese were cleaning out one American industry after another. So yeah, it, and all you have to do is look at the parking lot. I mean, you look at the uh, the uh, congressional parking lot, it's nothing but foreign cars. Audis, Mercedes, Benzes, BMWs, Lexuses, they're, they're too good to drive an American vehicle. What would have happened, do you think, if they had just uh, let both Chrysler and, and General Motors fall of its own weight? Well, frankly, I think the next one to go would have been Ford. Uh, some people say, well, no, Ford would have zoomed into the vacuum. Well, they didn't have the capacity to zoom into the vacuum. And so many of the suppliers would have immediately gone Chapter 11. What would it have done to the city of Detroit, do you think? Well, devastating, devastating. We probably still, the city still wouldn't be pulling its way out of it. Yeah, hard to imagine what might have happened without the bailout. Fascinating. Well, coming up, my conversation with journalist Soledad O'Brien. What's bringing her to Detroit next? Trauma can be defined as an overwhelming event or events that render a child helpless, powerless, creating a threat or harm and or loss. Abuse, neglect, bullying, exposure to violence and separation from family are all forms of trauma. If you or someone you love needs to be connected with a trauma-focused mental health professional, contact the Detroit Wayne Mental Health Authority 24-7, 800-241-4949. Here to talk, here to help. Experience the Galling difference at the all-new Galling Toyota in Warren on the corner of Van Dyke and I-696. Right now, take home the 2019 RAV4 LE for as low as $188 a month. Get to the all-new Galling Toyota in Warren today. Sunday at Art Van Furniture and Mattress. It's now or never. We're overstocked. Get special one-time only markdowns, discounts, and price cuts store-wide. Sectionals $5.99. Sofas $4.99. Dining sets $3.49. Once they're gone, they're gone. Store-wide savings up to 65% off. Everything with an extra 20% off the lowest price. Finance it with 0% up to 50 months with our Art Vantage Reward Card. Sunday at Art Van Furniture and Mattress. Are you looking to save money on your mortgage or lower your payment? Well, now could be the time with rates at their lowest point of the year. Call 248-308-5000 or you can chat with us online at davidhallmortgage.com. Tonight at 11, they capture the hearts of the country on America's Got Talent. But this local group is so much more than a choir. It has improved my life in a lot of ways. It has made me happier. Sometimes you just need 
a positive outlet. See how it's giving these young singers purpose. I want to change lives, and if I can do it through music, let's do it. The true power of the Detroit Youth Choir, how it's changing lives for the better. Tonight on Local 4 News at 11. All right, I'm joined by Soledad O'Brien. Thank you so much for being it's here with pleasure. us this Thank morning. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Tell me first, what brings you to Detroit? What are working. you doing? Working. I'm working. I mean, I've been to Detroit many times uh, covering stories, but um, we're here really focusing our entire show, matter of fact, on uh, Michigan and specifically Detroit. In fact, uh, shooting our show in uh, the DIA, which is phenomenal. Isn't it? Oh my gosh. It's so, I could go on forever about how beautiful it is. It's so it's so, so nice to be here. Here. Yeah, it's really lovely. And specifically, why Detroit and why now? Well, you know, I think for us, we felt that Detroit was a great place. Uh, we've been going around the country doing what we call listening tours and trying to tease out what are the stories people are talking about in the various communities from uh, California to anywhere on the East Coast. Uh, and we'll continue to do that through November 2020. Um, I think our strategy, for matter of fact, has always been you know, not to have yelling, talking heads. We don't find that very educational for people. We think when you go into a community and you talk to people in the community and you elevate those stories, you can do a lot more. So we've uh, been to San Diego talking about the housing crisis by following a young man who actually moved to Mexico. Uh, he's an American, mm -hmm. but the rent, the only rent he could afford with the job he had was, was in Mexico. So he reverse commutes into his job in the US every day. Um, we have done stories in Long Island of uh, people who are trying to figure out how to pay for their uh, insulin for their kids. It's so expensive. And I think when you look at issues through real people, you end up not having sort of just kind of confrontational political discussions, which is often what's on TV, but instead you have nuanced discussions about policy and what's right and what serves people regardless of who they are. And we think that that's been a really good strategy for our show. So here in Detroit, we'll look at the power of black women and the black uh, female vote. Many pundits, whether they're on the left or on the right, have said, listen, uh, in Michigan, it's gonna be black women who are really gonna make the difference in 2020. And we wanted to explore that. A and we also wanted to talk to soybean farmers mm -hmm. uh, as they now you know, have really been, I think, kind of pummeled with weather issues and also tariff issues. You know, how are they feeling about the future, both politically, but also just the future of their, their farms and they're really hurting. And what happens to those communities that support and live off the success of those farmers. So we do a deep dive into that. So it's interesting you bring up, you know, black women in Michigan 2020. What are you hearing? Because you're talking to so many people and kind of getting into the communities. What's your vibe? I think it's all about turnout. I think it's always been about turnout. And many people will point to 2018 as an example of two things. We, we you know, speaking to the Lieutenant Governor uh, Gilchrist as, while we're here as well. And when you ask him, you know, what is successful? He's like, show up and showing up as a candidate leads to turnout from voters. Uh, black women turn out the highest percentages, and so that's highly correlated with being successful in the person that they want to elect. So I think for wherever you're talking about, it's really about getting out the vote. And what gets out the vote, of course, is the message, and what's the message that resonates, which goes back to the lieutenant governor, who says, listen, if you talk above voters' heads, they're not gonna care. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about roads and it's about, and when we see this in matter of fact, it's about how do I pay for my kid to go to college? Exactly. How do I pay for my kid's insulin? How do I pay for my housing? I mean, these really basic challenges that again, what I find are always so interesting, they're sometimes posed as a left yelling at the right or mm -hmm. right yelling at the left, but, but they're really people issues. I mean, everybody has these challenges. That's what it boils down to. Yeah. So, you know, as you travel and you talk to people all over the country, you know, we've heard so much lately about how America, you know, people are angrier than ever. People uh, are people angry. Are that is true. More divided than ever. Uh, are you getting that sense that this is going to come down to emotion? No, I actually don't think so. I think, um, I think people are angry. I think, um, and I, I think that anger comes across in different ways. I think for a lot of people, they feel like they've been left out of the political process. I mean, when I, I remember talking um, a couple of years ago to a woman who was a nurse, and she said, you know, I make $60,000 a year, and I was working 40 hours a week. 
Now I make $60,000 a year, but I work 60 hours a week, right? And, and she described it as the sense of the dog paddle. Like you just have to paddle as fast as you can just to keep your head survival. above the water. And it just never ends, right? And at some point, dog paddling for survival uh, is really hard. And I think people are angry. I think farmers are angry. I think teachers are angry. Mm -hmm. I think I think college students, we're in the middle of a project right now about college students who are hungry. You can't really get a great job without a college degree. There was a time where you could be poor, not go to college, and get a very solid job that would pay for a house and a car. That Those days are gone. So how do you how do you make it happen? How do you make it work? And, and so I think people uh, across the board are, are really frustrated. And, and then that begs the question, how do you make it better? Yeah, I think that um, that's gonna be the question that goes to, I mean, there's 784 Democrats running right now, but I think they're gonna have to distinguish themselves by coming up to, with an answer to that question. And it can't be platitudes because people who are living stressful lives, you know, they can ferret out um, you know, BS when, when it comes to them. I think that you need to have specific policy strategies for people, which means how are you gonna help people pay for college? How are you gonna help people get good jobs? How are you gonna think about um, what what's gonna happen when AI is really used in every industry? What happens when robots replace people? I mean, there's all these big mm -hmm. sort of theoretical questions that come down to workforce, education, feeding people, the person, the candidate who I think can really tackle those questions and answer them in a way that's um, gonna resonate with the voter is, is, is gonna be able to win. And what kind of role do you think um, we'll see for women in this election? Yes, and I, you know, I, women always show up. Women always show up, they really do. And, and I think, I, I wish millennials would really show up because of course their voting numbers are, are, are terrible. And it is kind of appalling in general in the United States that we vote around 50 some odd percent, right? It's just, I mean, so I, I think women uh, often take the lead and you see a lot of women who are getting into politics. And, you know, I mean, I even when I talk to women who are new politicians, they sort of say like, I just got so sick of it that it felt like it had to be me. You know, they didn't want to be a politician, but they felt like, well, it just, uh, it has to be me. And and you see that a lot. So I think women are going to take leadership roles. And I think women are also going to take support roles in terms of really helping the candidates that they support, as they've always done. And then I think women are going to turn out and vote because I think women are mad. Do you think we'll see a shift with the millennials and the and the younger? Oh, I hope so. Voters? I think a lot of that has to be, and I wish a candidate um, or really an elected official or a group of elected officials would think about um, how hard it is for people to vote. I mean, it's just hard, right? Because in Puerto Rico, for example, they have a very high turnout because mm -hmm. everybody gets a day off. Right. So it's I think vote. like it's sort of something that's simple where you could say, you know what, everybody votes and everybody gets a day off and now you go vote. If you just make it simpler, a lot of the stories that we covered in the last election were about voting um, places being closed down, about less access, about more obstacles. I remember, um, you know, last time I voted in New York City, you you had to wait a couple of hours. Oh, not, lines around the corner. I run my own company so I can come in late, but like it's really hard to miss four hours of work on a day sure. when everybody is working. So and I, I hear it, that a lot from yeah. people. Will make it easier, it, but for that, that requires like a cultural change too. It requires, yeah, you know, sometimes I think legislation mm -hmm. leads cultural change. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as someone says, well, here are the new rules, right? And here, uh, everybody has to wear a seatbelt. Guess what? I don't think, I look at my kids, they hop into a car, they put on their seatbelt. It's just what we do now. And you know, you're young, but when I was growing up, not only did you not, your mother was your seatbelt, literally. Right. She put her hand to drive. And there she, were no car she, seats. Can't you like right. this? Just, you know, I mean, it's right. ridiculous now that I think about it, but sure, it was a cultural shift. And people would say, no one's ever gonna do that. And then there's legislation and then they do, they do. So I think for me, I think it is just a political will of do you want more people involved in the uh, you know the, the process? Do you want more people to vote? I, I think yeah, regardless of how they're voting, yes, you do. You want, I would like to see 80% of the country saying yes or no to something, not 50% deciding for everybody else. All right, well, we'll be watching it all play out. Thank you so much, It's Soledad. my pleasure, thanks for having Appreciate me, it. you bet. Stay with us, we'll be right back.
2019 Cadillacs are made for summer. It's your time to shine. GM employees and eligible family members get this low mileage lease on this 2019 Cadillac XT5 for $299 per month. The region is on the rise. Project after project, building, growing, innovating. We're building the future right now. Hard work matters here. IBEW Local 58 electricians and NECA signatory contractors bring commitment, pride, expertise, and passion to every job. It's our code of excellence. One vision, one team, one mission. To build the very best Michigan for all of us. Put us to work for you. The best contractors, the best electricians, period. Welcome, Judge Mathis. Thanks for coming to share an important message with the Wayne County taxpayers. Well, thank you for allowing me to help. You know, most of my life, I was a resident of Wayne County, and so I'm here to help because Treasurer Sabri wants to work with Wayne County homeowners to keep families in their homes and prevent foreclosure. If you're having trouble making your property tax payments, let us know. We have many resources to help. Take the first step towards staying in your home by going down to the Wayne County Treasurer's Office on the fifth floor of the International Building in Greektown. Stop by today to learn more about our payment plan and especially the newly extended interest rate reduction program. Already in the payment plan? It's important you stay in good standing. Making property tax payments is now easier than ever. We have placed payment kiosks in Rite Aid stores and community centers across the county. We've also added kiosks in our offices. Contact us at 313-224-5990 or email us at taxinfo at waynecounty.com. Welcome back and a quick programming note for you. You can watch Soledad O'Brien's Matter of Fact right here on Local 4 every Sunday at 5.30 a.m. Her Detroit-focused episode will air next Sunday, the 25th. Thank you for joining us for Flashpoint. Devin will be back next week. Meet the Press is next, right after Mitch Albom's Heart of Detroit. Have a great Sunday.